So I'd like to start with Dr. Piacentini. Let's start with, we're, we're going kind of in order in the alphabet of the things that we chose. So cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. Tell us a little bit briefly about why did it get started and in your career how you have seen it be very effective in work with youth and families. Okay, um, that's, a big, that's a big question. Can you hear me? Is this on? Okay, great. Um, so how many of you are familiar with cognitive behavior therapy? You've heard of CBT. Yeah, most, most people, it's, it's, it's um, become very, very common over the last couple of decades. It is probably one of our most evidence-based treatments, evidence-supported and evidence-based. So evidence-based is it is um, really based on a lot of basic research, trying to understand fear and anxiety. I'm going to be talking more from an anxiety um, um, and depression perspective on this. But we know that the underlying principles have come to us from experimental psychology, as Dr. Evans was, was saying, the basis of a lot of the work that we're doing. And it's supported by um, you know, hundreds of studies, some lo very large studies, demonstrating that it is effective, more effective than no treatment, more effective than a waiting list, more effective than many other treatments that it's been, been compared to. Um, it, it fares well with medication as well. In many ways, some of the research we've done has shown that um, for kids with anxiety who receive cognitive behavior therapy and or medication, uh, we did a nine-year follow-up study um, from one of our large projects and showed that kids that, that responded to CBT initially had, had much better outcomes nine years later than kids that uh, didn't or had medication only. So when we're talking about cognitive behavior therapy, it's really teaching skills that kids can use and, 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 and continue to use over time. Um, basically what Mark said, is um, you know that a lot of a lot of the work that he's talking about he comes from is related to CBT. What does CBT stand for? Cognitive, B is behavioral, and then T is therapy. The part that didn't make it into the acronym is emotions or feelings. So, as an example from anxiety, when we um, get an, when we are faced with some kind of a, of a fear or some kind of a fear eliciting or potential dangerous situation, real or imagined. We start, we, start, we start thinking about all the bad things that can happen. And our bodies react. It's fight or flight or freeze, right? I mean, our bodies react and our heart beats faster. We start getting really, really nervous and anxious. And that drives our behavior. And from a fight, flight, or freeze perspective, then the behaviors are to run away, to, to freeze and hope that the predator or the bad thing goes away, or to, um, or to, or to fight. And, and, and it's all very up from a very evolutionary perspective. Most time what happens when people are anxious or afraid of something, they avoid, they run away. We see kids that are afraid about going to school, they don't want to go to school. Kids that are at social anxiety don't want to engage with other kids or go to parties or amusement parks or the things that kids do. So in treatment, we break down anxiety or depression into these three components, the thoughts, the feelings, which for anxiety would be fear, in depression it would be sadness, um, and the behavior, which would be avoiding or coming back. And we have skills for each one of these. So we talk about fear, affect recognition, recognition of fear, recognition of depression. Again, very similar, very similar to ruler. Understanding these feelings, what I'm feeling starting to freak out or getting upset or wanting to avoid or run away or cry or ask for reassurance, then I know why. I'm understanding the, the, these, these, these feelings that I'm having in my body and the associated thoughts. These feelings are leading. If all of a sudden my heart starts beating fast, I think something bad is gonna happen. Maybe I'm gonna die. Maybe I'm gonna get sick. Maybe somebody's after me. Interpreting these bodily sensations and these thoughts now in the context of this is my anxiety. So we're teaching techniques for feelings, which would be relaxation techniques. Um, it would be um, you know, muscle relaxation, breathing, for example, guided imagery, things to settle our bodies. For the thoughts, we want to t teach a rational response. Let's think about these thoughts. What is actually going on? Is um, this kid really going to hurt me? When I'm called on in class, am I really going to have a panic attack? 
Am I going to start crying? When I go to school, is something bad really going to happen to mom? Am I going to get kidnapped, for example? So we um, teach strategies to more appropriately interpret the thoughts. This is my anxiety. This is my depression. I can manage this. I know underlying there's no real, real danger here. And then the behavior. The behavior is now I can, instead of running away or asking for reassurance, I can continue on with, with what I'm doing. I continue on with my life. The core piece um, related to behavior also is something called exposure. How many of you have heard of exposure therapy? So we have to learn to face our fears. Every time that I get an anxious feeling or become anxious or I'm depressed and I don't want to get out of bed um, and I give in, I give in to these, these anxious thoughts or, or, or depressive thoughts and, and bodily sensations, I'm reinforcing the anxiety. If I'm afraid that I'm going to have a panic attack when I'm doing a book report, every day I don't go to school and miss it, it reif reifies those fears. It makes those fears stronger. Through exposure, I put myself in these situations. I go to school, I reach out to other people, and I use the cognitive and, and behavioral and emotion regulation exercises I've been taught to make, to, to make through and be able to, to function. And the more I do that, the more confidence I gain, the more I'm more accurately able to interpret what's going on around me, and I'm able to overcome or, or learn how to better manage my anxiety and depression. Yeah. I don't have my own microphone. Thank you. Ramona, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, Dr. Piscantini, that was a fantastic <laughs> description of CBT. I want to talk to you a little bit, um, a little bit about what is CBT for clinicians and what is CBT for parents. Um, how to get CBT training. I, I'm also a CBT specialist, um, specializing in anxiety, but CBT is used for all different kinds of uh, disorders and challenges. Um, there's CBTI, uh, that's uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Uh, there's uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. There's CBT for eating disorders, trauma, uh, many things. It's a very evidence-based uh, treatment for many challenges. CBT, what I get most of the time when I talk about CBT, parents or clinicians ask me, it sounds so boring. <laughs> um, is it like, do you bring out the, the uh, book and do you read from, from the manualized treatment that researchers created inside your sessions? And that is not at all the case. CBT is something that uh, clinicians are trained in that spend a lot of time um, talking and working and perfecting their skills in CBT. Um, so it is not something that we go into session kind of reading, it's a framework that we use in session. And for clinicians, I encourage all clinicians to get specialized training in CBT, not something that you just read. I think reading is wonderful, but really getting your um, training f from those that are specialized. And for parents, you know, CBT, DBT, you know, all these acronyms, they're, they're really hard to navigate. And finding a CBT specialist for your son or daughter that is struggling for, from anxiety is really, really challenging. In fact, I'm doing a breakout session later on, actually pretty soon, and I'll be talking about kind of the ins and outs of how do you find a professional specializing? Where do you go and how do you navigate? And I, I have to say that I, oftentimes when I'm working with families and teens, I'm not providing CBT, I'm providing family-based treatment um, for, for eating disorders, which um, as opposed to being more of an individualized treatment, it's a family-based treatment, and kind of speaking a little bit more about the evidence um, within eating disorder research. I think a while ago, you, there was research that, or people believed that eating disorders were kind of caused by family dynamics and parenting styles, and actually more recent research is actually suggesting the exact opposite, and that caregivers are the best people to support um, treatment and, um, and, their, and their kids, and so evidence 
you know, that we've pulled in is actually really incorporating how do we help support families to kind of get um, kids to be re-nourished. Um, FBT, unlike CBT, which is more individualized, which also incorporates work with families, especially if you're working with teens, is really a family-based um, family um, intervention. And so um, it kind of looks a little bit different. Um, uh, unlike behaviors and thoughts and feelings, uh, because we know eating disorders are so medically risky, um, and we know that once someone is malnourished, their thoughts kind of shift, the main intervention is how do we improve food. And so just another way of kind of looking at um, evidence and evidence in how we incorporate treatment. Yeah. I wonder if I could just follow up on that um, for a moment, Dr. Kramer, because you just had a very important publication come out <laughs> looking at this concept of caregiver burden. We have a lot of caregivers in the room, and we're talking here in family-based treatment about typically parents or one parent, hopefully two, or caregivers. And um, I think it'd be interesting to hear a little more, because many folks knew about FBT but may not have direct experience in eating disorders, and yet there are some adaptations here, I think, from your work around thinking about caregiver responsibility, how do we get caregivers to lean in, and how do we predict burden? So would you mind just commenting a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that, you know, as being caregivers and the people who care, oh, thanks. <laughs> Can you hear, hear me better? Okay. Um, you know, you, I think generally we want our, our kids to feel better, right? And then, you know, <laughs> a teen might present with an eating disorder and oftentimes caregivers are tasked with the very job of saying, okay, you need to eat more, which is the very thing that when someone has an eating disorder, it's, it's the thing that they fear, right? And so um, I think oftentimes caregivers feel bad for kind of insisting that their kid is eating more um, and it can cause a lot of stress. They don't wanna make teens feel worse. Um, and I think our society has, I think our culture, right, talks about good food, bad food, right, weight and, and dieting, right? And so it becomes this really tricky mix um, and so some of the research um, that colleagues and I have kind of looked at are, you know, what are the factors that predict best outcome in care? We know that self-efficacy and so caregivers feeling like they're able to support their kids um, are, you know, some of the best uh, treatment predictors. And we also know that caregiver burden kind of makes it harder to um, participate in intervention and actually is more associated with dropouts. So family-based treatment is a really intensive treatment. You need a lot of time to be able to provide support because we're asking for parents to be available at every single meal and to provide support, which is hard in our society where we're busy working, we're going to school, we have all this stuff going on. Um, and one thing that um, we've kind of noticed is that caregiver anxiety is one of the major predictors of caregiver burden. And so family-based treatment, while we work on kind of finding different ways to kind of help caregivers feel like they are supporting their teen. And so we'll kind of every single session talk about the wins that kind of occur um, throughout care. I think one of the things that we can kind of focus on further on in treatment or um, kind of in terms of adapting treatment is how do we kind of reduce anxiety among caregivers and what are the interventions that we can use support, to support caregivers as well as youth who are in this treatment. Wonderful, thank you, and congratulations. Oh, thank you. Uh, for coming out. So what I want to invite you all to do is it, you can look in your red bag and you have uh, a notepad in there and you have a pen in there as well. You probably brought something to write with. And I'm gonna pose one more question to the panel. We have about 20 minutes left. If you have a question for the panel or a comment, write down the question Try to keep it to one if you can, um, or you can write two. We, we won't get to all of them, but if you have it, raise your hand and there will be um, someone with an AIM t-shirt on who will gather it from you. And they're gonna bring it over to Lori and Lori's gonna bring them to me. Then I'm going to, as they're speaking, look through them and see if there's a few themes that are coming up that I can pose to the panel member. Does that make sense? So question or comment? Use your notepad that um, we've provided and just give it to one of the, um, the youth at your table or if you don't have one at your table, just hold it up, they'll come and get it and bring it over to Lori. All right, I wonder if, if, if each of you could talk a little bit about um, some things that Mark highlighted, which has to do with the relationship. So there's a wonderful book that came out a few years ago um, from Guilford Press looking at 
the Therapeutic Alliance in Cognitive Behavior Therapies, right? Like, and, and there is this myth, and I think um, one of you spoke about it, that, you know, this is all, it's all cookbook, and it really doesn't apply to me because I'm not, I'm not eating what they're trying to feed me. I'm not, you know, that's sort of, I guess, a metaphor that can be useful or not, given that Dr. Kramer's here. <laughs> but, you know, I ain't buying what they're selling because it's just all cookbook and it doesn't apply to me. And so there's actually been a lot of work looking at how do we take what has been established in the evidence and adapt it to different cultural communities, different contexts, people who do work internationally who don't have the luxury of like 12 sessions, but they may have to train people in the community to deliver the nuggets of particular treatments. But none of this is happening if the young person or the family does not trust that the clinician knows what they're doing, but also has the best interest of the patient and family in mind. And so when we think about the therapeutic alliance, we're talking about the trust and the bond in addition to what actually happens in the session. And so I wonder if maybe each of you could talk for a couple minutes about how you attend to that relationship and that rapport. And by what session, if we are parents, should we expect that our young person's going to feel like, OK, this person's cool. I can, I can, I'm going to keep working with them. Like, what is your experience with that? And how do you cultivate that relationship? Would you like to start? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's my jam. All right. <laughs> we didn't even practice that question. <laughs> it's just her jam. Um, Dr. Joshi, I would, I would say, you know, that therapeutic relationship is more important than CBT or any other therapy that we're doing. Um, building that alliance, um, r you know, over the phone, um, talking to them about just what brings them there is, is huge. Um, I, on the most part, get parents who have read more books than I have. Hmm. Um, they often tell, ask me questions that I have no idea, you know, what the newest, latest kind of essential oil or um, particular diet um, or, you know, some other, some other kind of treatment that I've never heard of, and they educate me. And, you know, we all use different techniques based on what we're feeling, what Dr. Brackett was talking about. And it's important to really kind of see people and understand what they're experiencing so that we can apply CBT, so that we can know where they're at and we can effectively kind of have the treatment work. That's the most important process. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. Dr. Piacentini? Um, yeah, I agree completely. So fear is the strongest emotion. I mean, that's from evolution. You know, if we, we need to be aware of threats around us. And coming into a treatment, maybe that's something that, that a family isn't as comfortable with or they have misconceptions about it, can really be paralyzing and interfere with the treatment. So the, the two things that I think are most important, one obviously is warmth and understanding and listening. Everything that Mark said we have to do with, with the, the families that we work with. But the, there's a lot of research. We've done some and others have done it well across a variety of treatments and disorders that positive treatment expectations, if I believe the treatment is going to help, that leads to better outcomes. And it may be because of compliance, because if the therapist tells me to do something and I think it's gonna work, I'm gonna do it. And in CBT, that's difficult because we're, again, we're asking our patients to face things that are, that are challenging for them. So psychoeducation, educating families and work, and not just, not just you know, giving them bullet points, but discussing and talking with them and breaking down what we're gonna do and why we're doing it. And tailoring it to the specific needs of the families, to their levels, using examples from the families from the kids and focusing on how the symptoms they're coming in for have really made life difficult for them. If we can really understand them in a personal way and give them hope that the treatments we're doing are going to be helpful, that makes all the difference in the world. And not just with the kids, but also with the parents. Because a lot of kids, you know, a lot of times kids and parents suffer from some of the same issues. 
and if we're trying to get the child to face their issues in certain ways, and that may, that may um, make the parents anxious or upset or nervous or even angry, so we need to do it with both, but I think that that's gonna be really important, but you need the alliance. I agree completely that that's, that's the most important thing at the start of treatment and throughout treatment. And I think uh, with FBT, the alliance is a little trickier. Um, mm -hmm. With caregivers, you know, I think one of, there's five tenets of family-based treatment that a provider typically tries to incorporate throughout care, um, and I'll be presenting a little bit more on it um, later today and tomorrow, but um, one of which is that, um, is that we're, uh, caregivers are like kind of the expert of their, their kid, and so I think that's one way that we really try to build rapport, at least with caregivers. So I might be the expert on how an eating disorder makes their, their kids think, but the caregivers themselves have been raising their kids successfully, and so we really work together to kind of figure out what are the best ways to get their, their kid to eat more. And so through that, we kind of build an alliance and we're kind of a team, and I think you know it's really asking parents what are their goals for their child and kind of working together. I think with youth it can be a little bit I think the alliance kind of shifts over time, especially because I think there's a lot of fear involved with changing eating, and so sometimes it's not uncommon for teens in the beginning to actually not enjoy working with me, and they, you know, but I think as we can kind of work together and kind of help them find value and goals aside from the eating disorder and kind of get over some of the fear that, that improves when someone has better nutrition, rapport kind of builds, but again, it's through validation and kind of, you know, empathizing and understanding where the, patient is also coming from. Wonderful, thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, uh, for, for any of you, but reflecting on what Dr. Kramer just shared, how it is, it's tricky in FBT in particular because um, you're working with a family, the family is the client, and yet there is an identified patient. So, in that paradigm where people know, okay, we're signing up for FBT, we're all in this together, there's a certain amount of sessions, there's a pacing, there's family meals, we can track the progress. But what about in the situation in individual treatment and one parent asks, how can I best collaborate with my child's therapist in implementing CBT skills while also honoring the confidentiality of a child's sessions? And my experience is that the best CBTers are people who really understand relationships and understand whether or not the therapist is a parent themselves. And parents need some information, but a lot of the paradigms we have now in particular for OCD treatment, the parent is really the, um, the primary coach to help outside the sessions to implement, and probably for anxiety treatments in general. So could you comment on that? What what should our parents be asking for around collaboration without having to know the specifics of the session? Um, you know, kind of what rights do they have and what should they be looking for in their therapist around that collaboration? Let me go on. No. Okay. <laughs> um, well, developmentally, it's different for kind of different age groups, but generally speaking, in CBT, the parent is pretty involved. Um, so the parent, um, in my experience, in my therapy room, I'm very upfront with parents. I tell them that I will be very honest with them. I will keep the content of our sessions confidential, so that kind of speaks to the confidentiality. But I will tell the parents what we're doing in session, how we're doing it, teaching them the skills, what to say, what not to say, and how to implement um, some of their strategies on themselves as well. So that's a part of the CBT process, but that looks a little bit differently based on the age of the child. I know Dr. Piacentini and I are gonna talk a little bit more about that at one o'clock. Um, do you wanna speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, I, can, I, I think that that's a really great, great question. So the parents have the same, oftentimes, the thoughts and the emotional reactions. Um, that the kids do. So we need to educate families, the parents, um, in a very supportive way. We have to understand where our families are coming from, how they got to it. Again, again, Mark, you know, did 90% of this talk already in understanding 
Um, we want the parents to be supporters. Um, but as parents, and for those of you that are parents, you, you know that, I mean, we are just really wired to be, protect our kids. And anything that, that we think might be dangerous or unsettling or difficult for our kids, the tendency is to, is to help them avoid that. You know, we need to build resilience. We need to have our parents being therapists. Our parents need to be working with the kids to expose them, to try do new situations with the kids. So we can educate parents, we can teach parents some of the same techniques we're using, we can identify some of the same issues that the parents may be facing without necessarily talking about the child's specific symptoms. And in fact, there's actually some CBT models that only focus on the parents. So sometimes when we get a kind of very low motivated child that's difficult to kind of bring to therapy, we work with the parents only. And some of those are just as effective. The one word that comes up, if I can go again, is um, accommodation. How many of you are familiar with parental accommodation? And it comes, it comes from a good place. I, I accommodate my kids sometimes, you know. Um, we want the parents to be appropriate judges of what their children can and can't do. To build resilience, the kids need to be in situations that may be challenging or stressful so they can develop the tools and the skills to overcome these. If the kids never face any kind of adversity or difficulty by staying home from school, by, not, by acting out in, you know, in negative ways and not, not having any kinds of consequences, the kids aren't going to be necessarily motivated to do the difficult things they need to do. So we have to have the parents create environments that are going to be conducive for the kids to learn how to manage difficult situations. Thank you. Um, we have one, um, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so which treatments have you seen and the ones that you have the most experience with work for young people on the neuroatypical spectrum? also known as the autism spectrum. Um, and of course, that's a very, very broad spectrum, right? It will depend developmentally on what this young person is able to do. Uh, but I guess maybe the, a two-part question there is, what treatments have you seen among the ones that you have most um, familiarity with? And um, with regard to CBT, what is the youngest age that we can introduce CBT skills in your experience? So either of those questions. I'll go for it. Um, so neurotypical uh, and kind of neuroatypical, that's, those are kind of hot topic words. Um, we talk about the autism spectrum, the ADHD spectrum, those are very overlapping. Um, and there are many evidence-based treatments in that realm. Um, CBT is often used for emotion, anxiety management, um, behavioral therapy, ABA therapies, which are applied behavior analysis. Um, and those are kind of working on uh, difficult behaviors, transitions. Um, there are, um, you know, occupational therapies. Um, social skill therapies um, for to target those uh, social weaknesses in kids with ADHD and um, autism spectrum. So there is a large menu of evidence-based treatments um, for neuroatypical uh, kiddos, uh, youth, um, and adults. Um, with regard to age, I mean, we can go down, we've worked with, you know, one-year-olds and two-year-olds. We're not really focusing a lot on thoughts. It really is more parent training-based approaches, teaching the parents the skills to basically reward or reinforce or encourage behaviors we want to see more of and to ignore or redirect or not reward behaviors we want to see less of and be it you know, acting out behaviors, attentional behaviors, anxiety, OCD, whatever it, it might be. But it really falls, the younger the child, the more of the work is gonna fall to the parents. You know, we call it scaffolding, parents you know, creating scaffolding in the environment to really try to, re to redirect or direct the child to engage more in wanted and less in unwanted behaviors. Mm -hmm. We see babies. Huh? Some, yeah, babies. Some, yeah. some babies uh, pull out their hair, yeah, and, that's, yeah. and that's an evidence-based treatment. Mm -hmm. I think in the eating disorder realm specifically, I mean, I think with the younger 
kids definitely more involvement with parents and then as kids get um, ready to go off to college there tends to be more collaboration and then kind of switching more to an individualized approach um, as you reach adulthood but again families are typically always incorporated um, so. yeah and speaking of college dr. Kramer or or life after high school there is a wonderful uh, enterprise I'm getting Elmo over here um, <laughs> There is a wonderful enterprise, uh, wonderful project started by Professor Lawrence Fung, F-U-N-G, and it's the Stanford Neurodiversity Project. If you just look up Stanford Neurodiversity Project, you'll see a number of things they're working on specifically around helping with that transition age launch. Um, there are a lot of free resources and recordings of talks that might be very useful. I know there's a number of school mental health professionals in the audience. Um, and for parents who are raising children who are neuroatypical, there are some really good resources there for activities that can be done. And if they go to college, what kinds of things they should be looking for in a higher education landing place so that their neurodiversity, uh, they can land in a place where they not only fit in, but they can even have a sense of belonging because they won't be the only one and there will be a community there. So Stanford Neurodiversity project. Okay, so last question. Um, can you tell us the difference between CBT and DBT as differences exist since one was kind of adapted from the other? Um, would any of you like to take that question? I'll support you. I don't really do DBT, um, so I can, I can try to muddle through a little bit. They're both, they both come from the same tradition, both this kind of understanding thoughts, feelings, and behaviors to better manage, um, to better manage like intense emotionality. DBT um, incorporates something called mindfulness, so more mindful approaches, um, learning, learning to live or tolerate or, or, or kind of reframe um, intense emotion, um, but there are very strong behavioral underpinnings as well. Um, in terms of trying to understand the environment and the triggers to, to emotional reactions um, to better be able to anticipate and then deal with them. Um, in DBT, I think more so than CBT, there's also more uh, focus on acceptance. We can't change necessarily the way that we feel, what we think, what we do. Even with CBT, the goal is not so much to, to, to change our thinking, but really to learn how to manage our thinking our anxious thoughts in ways that we can still act, act in, in, in ways that are healthier behaviors, even though we might be feeling or thinking negative thoughts. And I think DBT, given a focus on more intense emotional reactions um, and more intense behaviors, that there's a greater focus on learning how to accept these thoughts and feelings rather than try to change them. I, how, how is that? I yeah, that was great. The expert there. Well, and you were getting into the idea of acceptance as one of our other alphabets. Yeah, I can add to that a little bit. here is ACT. Um, the format is, is different too. Mm -hmm. um, DBT, um, well, DBT is often used, like Dr. Piacentini said, intense emotions. Um, so maybe teens who are cutting, um, who are struggling with kind of a high level of depression or sometimes trauma. Um, and DBT has an individual co uh, component, but also has a group format. Um, a lot of clinicians say they do DBT or DBT skills. DBT skills are often taught in schools as well. Um, and those are all wonderful, useful skills. But a true DBT therapy includes the individual, so just one clinician um, for the youth, and a group format um, as well. And skills coaching. So um, as someone is, is actually experiencing distress, they're able to call their provider and ask for, like, in the moment, skills Phone. coaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you want to say anything about ACT? Or do you want me to add on that? So, do you, want to, do you want to start? Sure, ACT yeah. is also similar. They're, they're all really overlapping. Um, ACT is an acronym that doesn't like to be called ACT. Um, they like ACT, or Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And um, that is, of course, more acceptance-based. So those really powerful emotions, um, they're 
we learn skills around committing to experiencing those uncomfortable emotions um, through mindfulness and other, other skills um, while moving towards our values. Yeah, and part of the beauty of ACT, especially for young people, and part of the allure is it starts with, of course, the treatment relationship, but it begins with a conversation about values. And Dr. Brackett had a wonderful, had the picture up with the um, fourth grader who wrote about his values and what, what were the things important to him. And this is, when you sit with a young person early on in, um, you know, we asked ask a question about therapeutic alliance. It's probably by session three, but no longer than session five. So somewhere between three and five, that's actually where the research leads us about when does an alliance get established uh, in adults? With teens, it's a little more elusive. They might decide after the first 15 minutes that you're cool or not. <laughs> um, but we encourage our teens to, to you know, give it a couple sessions. So we know in adults it's three to five. It may be a little bit less in teens, it may be a little bit more. But in ACT, when we sit together and think about values and we inquire about the values, that then leads to the conversation about what we're gonna do in treatment together. And one of the differences um, in ACT is that rather than trying to teach our clients to um, kind of change how they think, which can change how we feel and how we behave or react to a certain situation, it actually teaches us to just notice. And the acceptance part of ACT is just really noticing, accepting and embracing these events, especially the previously unwanted ones. So people who've been traumatized, for example. Um, now, trauma-focused treatments are very specialized, but as it relates to bad things that have happened, ACT is a paradigm that doesn't focus so much on changing the way we think can change the way we feel and behave, but it starts with this idea of noticing and embracing so that we know what to do with them. And then the work of therapy starts. So. I'm going to, and like the others, I think DBT was also mentioned, psychological flexibility is the ultimate aim of many of these treatments, ACT and the others. <laughs>